if I, we use the word commonly, I don't know where we got it, Brother Barton. Maybe I do, but I don't know when I have wrestled over what to preach as much as I have this time. For some weeks, I had it, what I thought, settled in my mind. This is it for the share and just, just, you know, and I've worked on it, let it build up. And I like it when I get a message in time for it to really build up the pressure. But as I began to get closer to the meeting, it seemed like it, like it got a flat tire. The pressure started oozing out of it, you know. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at a kind of a dead outline. And then I've been torn. I was, I was settling pretty good. And Brother Bell, you messed me up yesterday morning. I was doing pretty good till you come along with that <laughs> challenge yesterday morning. You know I'm saying that lightly. Thank you for that challenging message. I appreciate all the preaching, but I like preaching that challenges me. And then the situation, a lot of things are going on, and I, I really carried this in my mind for some time. And I do not want to at all present myself as the fellow with all the answers, a know-it-all. But I do believe I have a Bible. Let me correct that. I do have a Bible. I know I have a Bible that has the answer to every dilemma that comes into our life. And Brother Martin, it's not because of your family. My family is going through a lot. A lot of you families are. But I really believe God wants me to deal with what I'm going to deal with this morning. And I want you to listen. Let God speak to your heart from His Word. I think when you listen to the text, you'll understand where we're going today. Verse number 33 of John chapter number 16. Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you that you might have peace. Notice the next phrase. In this world. Are you there? In this world. In this world. You shall. You shall, in this world, you shall have tribulation. In this world, you shall have tribulation. But then there's that Holy Ghost conjunction where God butts in. In this world... You shall have tribulation, but, but, I, I, just then, just a minute. Give me just a minute. I'll let you sit on this minute. I'll finish it. Do you know the word but is never followed by a period? Never. The word but changes and gives us the other side of the story. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And I call that when God but sin. I like it when God but sin. In this world, you shall have tribulation, but Whine and pout and moan and groan. And I'm not reflecting on anybody in particular. I'm just talking to all of us. You know, you know that's not what the Bible said. He said, but be of good cheer. Why could he say that? He said, all the tribulation saints are going to have is going to be in this world. And he said, but I have overcome the world. He overcame. Then when I got saved, he put me in him. And so I can say, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Let's bow for a moment of prayer. Father, we need you. Oh, God, we need you today. Lord, I have no idea. I know there's a number of requests that have been mentioned. Lord, there's a number of people here who are hurting inside that do not have the privilege of standing, Lord, before this congregation and speaking the hurt, the pain, the dilemma, the situation that they're going through. Father, there's hurting right here this morning in this crowd. 
that has not been verbalized to one single person because the hurt is so painful and sometimes even so embarrassing what's going on in our lives. But dear Lord, as I come to you this morning, I pray that you'll help us to see sufferings as you see sufferings. Do what you want to do. Do what needs to be done. Lord, down in this dungeon of despair, would you drop down a rope of mercy and grace? And Lord, would you somehow tunnel out where we can see other than what's around us and get a glimpse of what God is doing and wants to do in our lives. Help me to help your people. And for what you do, I'll praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Do keep your Bible open, please, for the study of the Word of God today. I Some years ago, many years ago, as a young preacher boy, when I did not even do outlining, I was studying one day, and God just got my attention, and I preached a message several times as a young preacher on wonderful blessings from the Word, but. I probably had not preached that in 25 years until after I had my cancer surgery last year. And as I was recuperating and studying, I got up one morning and God brought that to my remembrance. And so I preached it a couple of times. And then I got in Ephesians chapter number 2. And I thought God gave me the thought on when God butts in. Now, I want to make a statement. You may not understand it, and for all you who are shouting it out all the time, you probably will just have to endure for a few moments. But God has a way of butting in our lives with unexpected and oftentimes unwanted things. I'm that God butted into my life in salvation. I can go to Ephesians chapter number 2 and the first three verses dead in trespasses and sin that represents my past. But in verse number 4 God put it in by God who's rich in mercy with his great love for when he loved us. I'm that in Romans chapter number 5 verse number 8 God put it in in salvation. But God but God manifests his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Aren't you glad one day when you were on the road to hell and didn't care about yourself or nobody else, the God of all mercy and grace just bowed it in with conviction and conversion and saved you by the marvelous grace of God. And then after we're saved, God butts into our life with separation and sanctification. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And then God butts into our life with service. We're just going down the road of life, enjoying the Christian journey. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, God just butts in and places service call on our life. Only when I could go. But there's a part of that message, Brother Martin, I've never preached. And I say what I want to say, and I'm aware God's listening. I didn't want to preach it. I really don't want to preach it this morning. Because I've learned what you preach, you live. Good advice for younger preachers to watch that. Boy, I know what I'd do if I was in that situation. You just keep trucking, you'll get in it for long. Amen. But I want to preach this morning on when God butts into our life with sufferings. And I didn't say when the devil did. By the grace of God all these years, I'm almost there. I've tried to quit giving the devil credit for anything. Even if he'd done it, I don't want to brag on him. I'm aware there's a God in heaven that could do more with one finger than the devil could with both hands. 
Sometimes I feel sorry for the devil. He lives in a permissive will of God. He cannot do one thing to us until he gets God's permission to do so. If it got to you as a Christian and you're in Christ, it has to pass through Christ to get to you. Nothing has ever happened to you as a Christian but what first the devil had to get God's permission. But there's something that bothers me. Don't leave me now. All of these years I've been taught you're not supposed to question God. I've been taught we're never supposed to ask the question, why? I'll tell you one thing helped me. I studied Jesus hanging on the cross. And I heard him say, my God, my God, why? Now, I granted as far as I know, God never did answer, but it helped him to ask it. <laughs> God may never tell you, but it helps just to ask it every once in a while. But I want to deal this morning on this song on heartbreaks on the highway to heaven. Heartbreaks on the highway to heaven. And I want to deal with why they happen and how they happen and why they happen. And let you see some things from the Word of God. And can I just say this? Not a person in this building probably needs what I'm preaching any more than I do. I'm telling you, preacher, in 30 seconds time this morning, I sat there in the motel room and counted seven things going on in my family right now. I'd give anything in the world if I could go to sleep tonight and wake up tomorrow and it'd be over. Just as wouldn't it be wonderful to go to bed tonight and get a call in the morning they're bringing that baby and shut up bringing that baby home. Seven things going on in my life right now. I didn't have to think. They're just there. I live with them. So I'm not putting myself above you and looking down on you. I am preaching to me. An older preacher said to me as a young preacher, Brother Blue, if you want to help people, preach to yourself. Because people everywhere are people, and they all go through about the same thing, maybe just different circumstances. But I want to just slow down. I don't want it to, well, I want God's will to be done, whatever he wants. But I, I, I hope God will let me just stay slow down, and I want to look at God letting us go through these things in our life. God letting us have heartbreaks on the highway to heaven. Now, I make this statement rather not serious. I think you'll understand it. But again, if you want those, shout it out. Everything's hunky door. Hallelujah. Couldn't be better. You probably won't get much out of what I'm going to preach. But if you happen to be here today, and you're one of us who would just like to get off somewhere and just have a crying time, I believe God will help us from the Word of God today. Let me give you this. I'm going to come right to the text and preach this morning. My study of the Word of God has brought me to this far, and I don't know how much farther I can go with it. But if I understand God and His Word, there are four ways that God can deliver us from our heartbreak, from our sufferings, from our burdens, our problems. Number one, God can deliver us from our problems. Can I use an illustration we all understand, Brother Barton? It's like God could take a big old detrail bulldozer and just root every stump out of the road in front of us and move it out of the way delivering us from those problems. And I quickly say, don't you wish he would? Number two, sometimes God does not deliver us from them, but God chooses to deliver us through them. You go into the they run their course and it may be weeks, it may be months, it might even be years later, but one day on the other side, God will bring you out. I love this kind of February. March now, isn't it? But I normally don't like February. But you know how I endure February? I know it's but a season. It has a beginning. It runs a course. But April is coming. Well, I'm so glad 
God never takes us into them to leave us and forsake us. Sometimes God delivers us from our problem. Sometimes God delivers us through our problem. Sometimes God delivers us out of our problem. God will reach over right in the middle of it, pick you up out of it, and set you on the other side. I like it when he does that too. But number four, not only God delivers us from, God delivers us through, God delivers us in. God delivers us from. But sometimes God chooses to deliver us in our problems. You better hear what I'm saying this morning. There are heartaches that come on this road to heaven that will be with you the rest of your life. There are some afflictions, there are some family problems, there are other problems that come into your life that they'll be there till your dying day. But we don't have to be discouraged, we don't have to be defeated. God has sufficient grace to enable us to shout it out with victory in the midst of our sufferings. Now, let's approach suffering. And you ask the Lord to help me, and I'll be as brief as I can. First of all, I believe when problems come in your life, suffering, heartache, whatever you want to call it, I'm going to call it problems or sufferings. I believe the first thing we ought to do is examine our lives in the light of the Word of God and make sure that it's not God chastening us because of transgressions in our life. My own personal belief, and I believe that's where we ought to start every time, is this happening to me because of sin, either omission or commission in my life. And if you'll get serious with God, if it's sin, God will show you. What he does, stop arguing with God and repent, get right, start doing right, and God will eventually remove that problem. Well, what happens if you search your life and you realize, as far as I know, there's nothing wrong between me and God that's bringing this in me as chastisement. Apart from chastisement, there are five words I want to use from your Bible that deal with our sufferings as a Christian. I wish you would turn with me, please, to the book of James, chapter number 1. In James, chapter number 1, we will deal with two very briefly because of time's sake, and I want to major on the latter three of five thoughts as we look at them this morning. Let me say from James, chapter 1, verses 13 through verse number 15, that as believers... We suffer temptations. As believers, we suffer temptation. Now, you may be one of those holier than thou people who want us to believe that you would never have any problems, any temptation. But I want to tell you, I done read the book. I know better. Now, as you study the Word of God, and I'll deal with trials in just a moment, there are sometimes trials and temptations are used interchangeably, but the text reveals which one it really is. You see, a temptation is a solicitation from the devil to entice us to commit sin. But a trial is a testing of God to develop our Christian life. God never tempts anyone to sin. You say, well, preacher, what causes temptation? Notice, if you will, please, in verse number 14, I want you to notice, first of all, here in verse number 14, there is the surety of temptation. The Bible said that every man is tempted. I don't want to be mean, but come on, big boy. Every. For years, I looked at some more mature Christians and even some younger Christians. I always felt like they were far advanced over me. I thought, preacher, boy, I wish I was like them. They surely never have a temptation. But they're not a person breathing, living in this building today. That's a normal person that is not faced with the same temptation that everybody else is. Maybe different circumstances. But every man 
is tempted. There's a surety of it. Then there's a source of it. What brings it on? God said there's two things. Number one, he has drawn away of his own lust. I call that the inner source. And I personally am convinced that's at least 90% of my problem right there. Drawn away of his own lust, that's inward. Then and enticed, that's the outward. Now, we've got the idea that it's always something or somebody else. If it just wasn't for them. Well, do I need to explain what I'm talking about? If that woman had put her some clothes on and cover her up, I wouldn't be tempted. Granted, she ought to be dressed right, and that does add to it, but that's just the outward source. The inward source is I am drawn away of my own lust. And, and you see, you can withstand temptation as long as opportunity is not there. You can withstand opportunity if temptation is not there. But if temptation and opportunity ever come to the same point in your life, you better know something to the grace of God. You say, well, preacher, why do we suffer temptations? And I'm not going to deal in detail with this, but I want to mention this. God lets us suffer temptations for one reason. To deliver us from confidence in self. We get this big idea just like Peter had or these other fellows may, but not me. This is why we should never say in the flesh, never. Never. How many times have you been sitting in a good church service like this and all of a sudden, man, you caught your mind and it was wondering about something that you hope and pray you would never do? Come on now, don't just take off your wings and let's be what we are. I want to kind of smack myself upside of the face and say, what are you doing? Did I think that? You see, none of us are anything but dirt, but flesh, and outside the grace of God. We all deserve hell, and as long as we live in this body of flesh, we will suffer temptation. Now, I'm going to make a statement. Some of you will have to chew in a while. Thank God for temptations. You know why I say that? If they didn't come, I liable to let down my guard and the devil have me trapped before I ever knew I had fallen into his trap. Temptations are warning signals that cause us to, can I use a good mountain word, to run scared. I have a list and I could make it much longer. Brother Martin, the preachers that I have preached with that are out. Many of whom were greater men of God than I will ever be. But they ignored temptation and went on and got too close to the edge and fell in the pit. Thank God for that loud buzzer, and I want it to keep sounding loud. I want to be reminded constantly that I, Stinny Baloo, am a potential of a statistic to come back next year. You people come back. And did you hear? Have you heard about Brother Luke? Have you heard? I pray it don't happen. By the grace of God, it will not. But I want to be aware of the fact I am a candidate for falling if I become careless with temptations. Number two, we suffer trials. We suffer temptation to deliver us from confidence in self. We suffer trials to develop us for Christian service. Why in the world did God let this happen to me? Trials are not in our life to destroy us, but to develop us. 
Again, I want to be brief, brief, so look at the text in chapter number 1, verse number 2 through verse number 5. Verse number 2, James said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Now, there's the word temptation used, but when you read the next verse, you find out it's not a temptation, it's a solicitation for evil. It's an enti- it is a testing of our faith. I want to say this. I think I may have said it here before. Verse number 2, the only interpretation I can give you verse number 2, when you see trouble coming, you're supposed to say, Whoa! Trouble again. I confess quickly, I've never arrived at that place in my Christian life. I'm just like most of you. Oh, no, not again. Lord. Now, why would God make, can I say it, and I'm, I'm aware of what I'm saying. Why would there be such a foolish statement? Seems like in the Word of God. The next verses explain why we ought to count it joy when we fall into diaper temptation. The very first word of verse number three is knowing this. We ought to know when trials come, God. God's in the process of promotion. You go through the school year and you have those little tests, but when it gets time for promotion at the end of the year, you take a final exam. And I say to you, God never throws a trial of your faith into your life just to be doing something. God's got promotion in sight. And God lets these come to develop us for Christian service. Very simple outline. Look at verse number three. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Look at me just a moment. i got to move. Anybody in here need any help in the area of patience? You heard about the fellow praying, Oh, God, give me patience. Lord, right now, give me patience. You do not develop patience shouting it out. Number two, God gives us these trials to develop our perfection, our maturity. Look at verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. God's method of maturing us is putting us in the furnace of afflictions, testing our faith with fire and fiery things to mold us and make us into his own will for our life. Number three, verse number five, not only it develops our patience, it develops our perfection, but in verse number five, God allows trials to develop our prayer life. I don't want to be critical, but I do want to be true to the Word of God. Don't grab verse number five out of its context and say, well, if any man like wisdom, let him ask of God. Can I say what I want to say just to clear up all the air? That doesn't mean if you're a dummy, just ask God to give you sense and you'll have some. Now, we ought to pray about everything. I'm not minimizing praying. I'm simply saying, this verse says that in the context, in the time of our testing, God develops our prayer life. You preachers can preach an hour on this, but I just make the statement move on. You don't pray when things are going well like you pray when you're in trouble. I want to make another statement, something you'll have to chew on. I am convinced that everywhere in every in each Christian's life that's going to be used of God, there will come a place where God will bring you to the end of yourself. Can I say it in plain language? Where you're going to have to fall before God and say, Dear God, you're going to have to take over. I don't know what. And when that happens, you know what God's probably going to say to you? That's what I've been waiting to hear. I sign Bibles for your trust in the Lord all my heart, and I don't understand in Proverbs 3 and 5. And so help me, that's one of the worst verses we've tried to live in my life. I, I can handle it. I can figure it out. Come on. But God will allow trials to come in our life to develop us in our patience, in our perfection. And in our praying. 
Now, I want you to take your Bible, please, and turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter number 8. God allows temptations to come to deliver us from confidence in ourself. God allows trials to come to develop us for Christian service. But thirdly, in Romans chapter 8, verse number 28, if you want to write it down, then I'll do it. God allows things to come into our life. And I don't want to tell you why until I get through with it, then you'll see it. The Bible said in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things. Now, there's a little bit of lightheartedness what I'm fixing to say, but there's a whole lot of truth in it, so I want you to listen to me in that manner. If you've got a problem, preacher, if somebody comes to you with a problem, Romans 8, 28 is still in the book. That's my favorite answer. You've got a problem? Romans 8, 28. But you know what I discovered? Romans 8, 28 is a good answer for me to give you. But it's not nearly as good an answer for you to give me. What I'm saying is Romans 8, 28, so you need, but if it's me. I'm not being derogatory, but I mean, sometimes you can hear Romans 8, 28, and you know, it just loses everything it ever had. Now, there's three things I want you to see in this Romans 8, 28. First of all, I want you to notice those puzzling incidents. And we know that all things. Can I ask you a question? If you're writing, just keep writing. Do not look up here. I like eyeball contact. Did you ever hear anybody say, well, it's just one of those things? You know where that came from? Right there. You know what a thing is? It's something you can't explain. You can give 500 reasons why it shouldn't happen. No reason why it happened. It happened the wrong time. It happened the wrong place. It happened the wrong person. But you can't explain it, so you just back up and gesture your hand and say, well, it's just one of those things, those puzzling incidents, those unexplainable things that happen. How many times in my life have I said, why in the world did that happen? I've even gone so far as to try to tell God 50 reasons why it shouldn't have happened. And he could have prevented it if he would have. I'm preaching. I stand behind that statement. Those puzzling incidents. And I want to cry, why in the world, Lord, did this happen? And I want you to notice also in verse number 29, not only there's a puzzling incident in verse 28, but there is a predestined image in verse number 29. The Bible said in verse number 29, I know it gets quiet when you use the word predestined, but the Bible said, for whom God did also foreknow, did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Now look at me just a moment. Look at me and I'm going to read on. Predestination in the Bible has nothing to do with some going to heaven and some going to hell. And y'all sound like a bunch of hyper Calvinists. Y'all believe that, don't you? Christ tasted death for every man. You cannot find a sinner that God does not love and that Christ did not die for. Predestination is mentioned here. It's mentioned in Luke. I, I, I don't want to run that rabbit out. For that doctrine, that's not a rabbit very far. But here, we're predestinated not to be saved, not to go to heaven, but to be conformed under the image of his dear son. If I can say it in plain language, God so loved his only begotten son, his firstborn, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he wants every one of the rest of his children to be just like him. In the community I grew up in, there was a man and a woman had nine boys and then had a girl, ten children. Them boys started to school when the oldest one was just a little bit younger than I was. And Brother Barton, if you've seen one, you're going to have to wonder who the brother was when he starts school next year. 
The last name was Swallows. He's one of them Swallows boys. And I mean, just stair steps. God loves Jesus Christ so much. I'm not talking about a form of him. I'm talking about a personality. God loved what Christ was so much, or what Christ is so much, that he wants every one of us to be a spitting image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me deal with this word image just a moment. If you and I were using this word in our day with today's translation of the word, we'd just call it God wants to be able to see us to be a mirror where he can see himself in our life. But in the Bible, the reference is made to the refiner of silver. They'd dig the silver oil they'd, or they'd put it in, the, in a vat. They would put the fire under it. They would boil the dross to the top. Then they'd wipe it off, let it cool off, wipe the dross off, boil it again. And Psalms chapter 12 said that it took seven times to purify it. Most silver ore refiners were not readers of the Bible, so you know what they did? They didn't worry about seven times. They boiled it, scraped it off, boiled it again, scraped it off, until finally they could lean over the vat and see a clear mirror image of themselves in the silver. All of you, like myself, have stood by the body of water somewhere, looked off in the water, and saw the reflection of yourself. You know what God is doing with these things that come into our life? He is literally burning out everything that doesn't reveal Christ. It's not, preacher, he's got to produce Christ in us. He's already there. It's he's got to take off everything else that distracts from Christ in our life. You say, well, preacher, how long will this be? How long will I suffer these things? Depends on how long it is for you get willing to give up them things that God's working on. Now, why do we suffer things? We suffer things to display a Christ similarity. Now, let me tell you something. I know what I'm saying. I'm not saying it lightly. I just have no confidence in this professing religion that never produces a change of lifestyle. Don't come up to me and waste my time in yours after service. I have no confidence in it. If you is what you was, you ain't. You've got that and figured out? I don't care what it takes. If you say, God is going to burn the world and its dross out of your life. And God is going to be able to look over the balcony of heaven, preacher, and see the image of his son in our life. But oh, after all, isn't that the power of our testimony? It's not what I say. The power of our testimony is a life that reveals Christ to those that look upon us. Now turn your Bible, if you will, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. One of the reasons of not having good vision is I can't see the clock. I mean, one of the good things about it. So anyway, we are getting on as good as we can. Number one, we, we suffer temptation to deliver us from confidence in self. Number two, we suffer trials to develop us for Christian service. Number three, we suffer things to display through us a Christ similarity. But in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, we find that Christians suffer thorns. Now, I know everybody in here has had thoughts. If you've done much study of the Bible, I'm talking about the adults at least. Why this thorn? What is this thorn? And why is the thorn there? And I don't want to take a lot of time, but let me give you these three things. about. In verse number 7, you have what I'm calling the purpose of the thorn revealed. You men of God, if you'll notice, verse number 7 is an unusual verse in the fact that it starts and ends with the same statement. Look at verse number 7. Unless I should be exalted above 
through the abundance of the revelation, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Starts and ends with the same phrase. You don't have to worry about what God's talking about when he says it twice in the same verse. Oh, come on now, come on. One fellow said, Preacher, I don't have a pride feel bone in my body. As far as I know, pride don't get in bones. One of the things you have to learn as you go through life, and I don't take me wrong if you do, that's just between you and God. You see, as long as you never do anything, have anything, or know anything, you'll have a pretty easy Christian life. You know, you know nothing, do nothing, have nothing. They won't talk about you. But if you learn a little bit of something, you start doing something, you accomplish something, then you're going to become the target of somebody to shoot at. So you've got to get a divorce from public opinion, graduate from the school of what others think, and decide you're going to better have the approval of God than the applause of the brethren. But it is easy to get lifted up through success. Sometimes success can be more dangerous than failure. Failure will drive you to your knees. Success can produce pride if you're not careful. I mean, after all, I spent some hours preparing that outline. Come on. Nobody else can do that like I can, and I'm not speaking to me. I'm talking about you saying that. You know, I got a lot of problems, but one of my problems is not being wrong. I still hadn't registered on some of Pride! God resisted the proud! God can't stand pride for your people! So said God said, I blessed you with so much knowledge. So much in the ministry, so much in the work of God to keep you from getting to looking at what I've done. I'm going to have to stick a little thorn in your flesh. The thorn comes to keep you. You say, well, I would never get exalted. Man, do you hear what you just said? You're already bragging on yourself. I would never get exalted. That's confidence in the self. said, I know how to burst your balloon. I know how to let the air out of your tire. Keep you from getting exalted above measure. There's the purpose. Number two, in verse number eight, there's the prayer for the thorns removal. He said in verse number eight, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice or three times that it might, that it might depart from me. I, I got thinking about stinted blue in this situation. I can't answer for nobody else, but I know about how I would pray. My first prayer, I think, would be, Lord, you know, i got this thorn that's bothering me. Take care of it, please. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I prayed about it. The second time, I'd get a little bit lot more serious, you know. And I'd want to be sure God knew it was hindering me from doing the work of God. Come on. The third time, I'd probably get in that, oh, God, praying gear. It kind of done me good to find out Paul prayed three times and didn't get an answer. I don't feel so bad now when I pray over something that don't come to pass. I don't seem to appreciate that much. But I want you to notice the third thing. Not only there's, a, there's the purpose of the thorn revealed, there's the prayer for the thorn's removal. But in verse number 9 and 10, there's what I'm calling the privilege of the thorn recognized. The privilege of the thorn recognized. Look at verse number 9 and 10. And he said unto me,
You will never know the sufficiency of the grace of God for the thorn until you have the thorn. It is so easy. It's so human, Brother Ray, to see things happen to somebody. Say, I don't know how in the world they stand up under that. You know why you don't know you've not been there? <laughs> and you have not experience the sufficiency of the grace of God. I'm telling you, God's grace is sufficient for whatever the thorn may be that comes into our life. You mountain folk will understand my language. I've got a pickup truck at the house, Brother Barton, and I purposely like to run about 28 pounds of air in the rear tires just so it don't bounce so much when I'm not carrying a load. But if I go down in the woods and cut a load of firewood, if I don't make some provision for them tires ahead of time, I load them down and they get this number. Flat, half flat. You know what I'm talking about? But if I'm going to load that truck down before I ever go to the woods or wherever I'm going to get a load, I pull it around to the back. I open up my shop. I kick the air compressor on. Stick that nozzle on there, and I jack them up to about 35 to 40 pounds. And then I put the load on them. You know what they do? I'm about to have to run in spite of it. Every time God starts to put some pressure, some weight on us, the devil wants to put something on us. God said, wait a minute. I'm going to pump him full of grace. And God brings down that distribute of his grace and pumps it up in us so we can stand up under the load that God puts on us. And we would never know that grace if the thorn had not existed. Pastor, I'm not going to embarrass you, but I, I really wish you would join me a moment. I need another human being up here, if you would, just a moment. I want to illustrate something else about the potential of the privilege of this thorn. I'm, I'm out of breath right now. We do know, Brother Barton, the thorn is not literal. It's figurative. Everybody understand that? But for the sake of this illustration, I want to make it a literal thorn. Everybody with me? Brother Barton? I want you to be Paul for just a moment. And you're going to be Paul and you're going to have a thorn. I didn't ask one of the worst places to get a thorn. And you come to me, I'm the Lord, and you said, I want you to do something about this thorn. God said to Paul, I won't remove the thorn. I tell you what I will do. I'll take your hand in mine. I'll dip this other hand in the bomb of Gilead. I'll just stand here and rub that thorn. And you and I will have conversation. And Paul said, I'd rather have the thorn and have him than not have the thorn and not have him. It brings us into a relationship that is unknown in any other person's life. Now, let me give you the last, and i got to close. Come back to our text, John 16. I hope I've not preached too long. We suffer temptation to deliver us from confidence in self. We suffer trials to develop us for Christian service. We suffer the things to display through us for Christ's similarity. We suffer thorns. I didn't give you that, did I? To demonstrate Christ's sufficiency. There is no thorn bigger than him. Can I, remember, can I remind you the thorn is an emblem of the curse? And at Calvary they set the curse on the head. He wore my crown of the curse so I could have his crown of righteousness, his crown of glory. But now then in verse number 33 of John, 13, John 16, these things I have spoken unto you, that you might have peace. In this world, you shall have tribulation. Not only do we suffer 
trials, temptations, things, thorns. But we suffer tribulation. In this world, you shall have tribulation. Look at me just a moment. Don't turn me off at what I'm fixing to say. If you were to go to the strong concordance, and you look at the word temptation, if you hear in John 16, 33, there are, there are several other words that it's translated into in our English language. Several usages could be applied. But one of those is what's upon my heart, and I want to deal with it this morning. One of the meanings of that word tribulation is the word pressure. Can I deal with that for the final thought this morning? In this world, ye shall have pressure. Is anybody in here been under pressure any time lately? And I think if you study that, you'll discover it's not just single pressure. It's plural pressures. I think sometimes, you know, and I, I mean this right, I'm going against what I just go through preaching. But I believe sometimes I think I could handle one point of pressure. You know, if God just, if just one area pressed him, but Paul said we're pressed on every side. About the time I, you know, I get adjusted to this, and man, wham, I get hit from another side, then the other side. When I study the picture of this, here's what I come up with. Everybody in here, I think everybody of any, any age understands. You know what a horseshoe looks like? Everybody know what a horseshoe looks like? You know, a big old upside down. See? This is the way God has to deal with us. I said has to. He has to and because of our unyieldingness and our unwilling to submit to his will at an easier manner. And so God just about has to wrap us around in pressures. If God just put pressure behind, we kick off to the side. God put it on one side, we kick off the other side. Crazy, carnal illustration, blame it on me, I just can't do any better. But some of you are country enough to know what it is. I remember back on the farm, we used to try to drive a cow to the barn. Now, for you young people, cows do not have steering wheels. I don't mean that kind of drive. But to drive the cow to the barn, you get behind her and you kind of do this side, you know, back to this side. So, and you get her nearly to the gate. She will dart off this way. Come back around and you... Say a few choice words and you go back after her. and You know, like God bless America. And you uh, bring her back down to there. And then she goes this way. There's only one way to keep that cow from darting off to the side. Anybody know what it is? Put a blockade there. It'll be amazing when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ and see how many things God had to bring into our life. Pressure from every side because of our fleshly desire to kick out. Do you know what the opening of that horseshoe is, Brother Whittemore? When God wraps in pressures around us, the opening in is the bosom of the Lord Jesus Christ. God allows us to suffer tri tribulation to drive us to his side. Can I be personal? Can I be personal just a moment? This thing that's wrapped around you right now has brought you to lean on him in a different way than other things. Things in my life, the same is true. All the same is true. See, God knows our flesh is prone to wonder. Prone to go astray. Just about the time it looks like we're getting ready for God to use us, our flesh will dart out. And so God just has to wrap pressure all the way around us. Where there's nowhere to go. But it's hurts. All on his bosom. 
and sob your sorrows away in the loving arms of a merciful high priest. We suffer temptation to deliver us from confidence in self. We suffer trials to develop us to Christian service. We suffer things to display a Christ similarity. We suffer the thorn to demonstrate Christ's sufficiency. We suffer tribulations to drive us to God's side. Now listen, and I'm through. I believe it is of utmost importance when trials and troubles and these problems come in our life that we seek the face of God as to why. Because if I don't know why this is happening, I probably will never accomplish or let God accomplish what he wanted. I know we've been told don't ask why. But what kind of daddy would it be that would whip his children and them not know what they're getting a whipping for? God is not going to just let it happen to be doing something. Behind every heartbreak, there's a purpose or multiple purposes. And it's not to destroy us, but to develop us and draw us closer to the bosom of our lovely Lord. Let's stand together, if you would, please. Heavenly Father, Oh, God, thank you for ministering to my own soul as I prepared and I preached today. Lord, I have heard, we have heard public testimonies of heartbreaks. These, thy children that's on the highway to heaven today. And I know, dear Lord, there are more unspoken requests in here unknown to the general public than there are those that have been spoken. Lord, I'm so glad I can stand here today fully convinced in my soul that the devil will not be able to do anything to me without having first getting your permission. Lord, and I know if you allow it to come to me, it's had to come through you. And as it comes through you, you will take the sting out. You'll cool the fire down. You will prepare everything that's needed where it will not destroy me, but it will develop me and my Christian life. Lord, do what you want to do. You will be done these moments of invitation. And Lord, this is something that's not just a trip to the altar, though many may need to come and help them to come if they do. But this is something, dear Lord, that we put in shoe leather and we let you teach us your ways through the experience, the school of experience of life's journey. Thank you for Pastor Barton. Lord bless he and his dear wife, their children and grandchildren, their family, the church family, and every family that's here today. Only you know what's going on in the mind of people after the message like this. But I pray you accomplish that word and you send it. 